Lieber Heinz, dear former Federal President of Austria, former Prime Minister Michael Ungureanu, <laughs> former Deputy Prime Minister Vesna Pusic, Secretary of State Alexander Bobko, Excellencies Professor Randeria, Former Vice, no, she's not, she was not able to come. I wanted to greet Ulrike Lunacek, the former Vice President of the European Parliament. Distinguished guests, 
Dear Mr. Soros, oh, right, here you are. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you, welcome you here at the Hofburg, more precisely at the Geheime Ratsstube, that's what the room is called, the Privy Councillor's Chamber, a prominent venue for talks and discussions and meetings for centuries. Tonight's ceremony continues that tradition of intellectual exchange in honor of a very special occasion, the 35th anniversary of the Institute for Human Sciences. I'm very pleased to welcome tonight's keynote speaker, Professor Michael Ignatieff, who stepped into the breach for Professor Ira Katz-Nelson, who broke his arm, I believe. Well, gute Besserung. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 35 years of the Institute for Human Sciences, this anniversary inevitably brings one particular topic to mind, and that is refugees, or flows of refugees, as it is often referred to nowadays in those somewhat impersonal terms. 35 years ago, in 1982, about 150,000 refugees came to Austria upon the declaration of martial law in Poland. It was precisely around that time that one intellectual, also from Poland, made his dream come true here in Vienna. He founded an institute for advanced study, a center of excellence for social and human sciences. This dreamer, quote unquote, of course, dreamer, was Krzysztof Michalski, a Polish philosopher of barely 34 years at the time, and his ambitions were certainly befitting his age. This marked a stunningly exciting time, or stunningly exciting times. Within a very brief time, he and his colleagues managed to find financial supporters, very important, and invited the first visiting fellows to Vienna. Soon after, Pope John Paul II became aware of the Institute and started the tradition of the annual Castel Gandolfo talks, which he hosted for 16 years. The legendary Jan Potocka memorial lectures brought some of the most renowned philosophers to Vienna from Hans-Georg Gadamer to Charles Taylor, Jacques Derrida, or Paul Ricoeur. These are just the philosophers. I don't mention the historians, the sociologists, and so on. <clears throat> I don't know whether Tim Snyder is here, for instance. Anyway, and the equally renowned Wednesday Club gathered personalities, some of whom were later to pursue remarkable careers, such as Joschka Fischer at the time, or Angela Merkel, uh, or a young Hungarian bearer of hope named Viktor Orban. Um, at the time, I think he was vice chairman of the Liberal International. Times have truly changed uh, since then. <laughs> Uh, not only are the countries from the former Eastern Bloc now fully-fledged members of the European Union, um, the challenges faced by the international community as well as by each and every one of us have also changed fundamentally over these 35 years. Threats have become more global, technological possibilities have undergone phenomenal growth, the human genome has been deciphered, the existence of the Higgs particle has been proven. We are facing forms of communication and opinion shaping processes that were at the best dreamt of in the 80s. And our political form of liberal Western democracy is increasingly coming under pressure. Only the explo exploitation of our planet continues to advance steadily, I might add, and is downplayed just as steadily, time and time again. These changes, however, occurring at an ever faster pace, require critical reflection and debate, fact-based analysis, and an exchange of rational arguments. 
and it is the merit of the Institute for Human Sciences that for the past 35 years it has been offering a space, a space where all of this is not only possible, but it takes place at the highest possible level. 16 fellowship programs, I think 1,300 1, fellows since its inception, and over 200 events per year are a testament to the Institute's extraordinary ex ex engagement and success. For many years now, I have been following its activities and I would like to express my respect and appreciation to all of those who have contributed to this success. Your achievements have been truly remarkable and you have significantly enriched the intellectual map of Vienna, of Austria and of Europe. Again, my heartfelt congratulations I wish the Institute for Human Sciences all the best for the future. Thank you. Sehr verehrter Herr Bundespräsident van der Bellen, sehr verehrter Herr Präsident Fischer, meine sehr geehrte Damen und Herren. I'm going to continue in English because I think I will be more intelligible to most of you in this room. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to the 35th Jubilee celebration of the Institute of Human Sciences. The Institute was founded in 1982. That was the year I moved to Europe. Um, to make many parts of Europe my home. It was the year I came as a doctoral student to Heidelberg. The political geography of the continent has changed beyond recognition in the past 25, 35 years, and so has the intellectual landscape. When the IWM was founded in the midst of the Cold War, the ideological confrontation between the two blocs and the resulting divide cutting through the middle of Europe was the defining theme. It was certainly an ambitious plan to establish a center of dialogue here in Vienna at a fraught time. It was also a courageous one. It proved to be, I think, an invaluable contribution in bringing both parts of Europe intellectually closer together. After 1989, when many people wondered if the Institute was still needed, the Institute was not only a close observer and commentator on the transformation processes in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe, the IWM was very much part of history as it was being written. It actively helped to shape the transition to democracy through scholarly inquiry, but equally through furthering political debate. A quarter of a century later, it continues to address urgent issues of our time. And sometimes in the region, it's difficult to remember <clears throat> that Europe is no longer at the center of world affairs today. The after effects of the divide between East and West can still be felt, but Europe's global importance has diminished. This change is reflected also in some of the new regional and thematic repositionings at the Institute. Extra-European comparisons and the experiences of the Global South open up new, exciting, comparative perspectives. Also on Europe's past and present, which is a product of these spatial and temporal entanglements. Today's major fault lines of political and social conflict run not only along national borders across East and West, North and South, but also through each one of our societies. The Institute was established in a tiny apartment here and has moved to new premises, which most of you know much better and much longer actually than I do since. It was the founding rector, Shishtof Michalski's conviction that it was imperative to create an institution as he defined it, one which helps to understand the world, but also to change it. 
a place for reflection and research, a source of political and social change. On the 25th anniversary of the Institute, he said, to establish dialogue between younger and older generations of scholars across frontiers and fault lines, that was and is the task which our Institute intends to perform. It remains as timely and relevant a task today as it was when the IWM was founded under the mentorship of Father Joseph Tishner. Time and history were on our side, but so were the city of Vienna and the government of Austria, both of whom have continued to provide generous moral and material support to the Institute since its inception. And I would like to take this occasion to express my very sincere appreciation for their support. But please allow me a very personal word of gratitude, singling out two people who are in the audience, who have warmly and very graciously received me, an outsider, a stranger to the city, and a stranger to Vienna, and have helped me make Vienna into my new home. Bundespräsident van den Bellen was the first person I paid an official visit to when I came exactly three years ago to the city. It was in his capacity then as the Beauftragte der Stadt Wien in charge of the universities that I went to meet him. Those were the days when he did find time to come to the IWM to attend a lot of lectures. He hasn't had the time since, so we've decided to come to you. But as a little present, we brought you the books that you are probably missing because you're not listening to the lectures at our place. So our little present is going to be 11 books written over the last three years by our fellows. <laughs> I hope you're going to find some time to read uh, those. But I would like to thank you especially personally for your generous invitation to celebrate this very special occasion in the beautiful premises of the Hofburg, and it's indeed an honor for me to be standing here addressing you tonight. I would also like to thank your whole team for the organizational effort and mention especially Oberat Magister Meinhard Rauchensteiner and Oberat Magister Diego Reiner for facilitating this celebration. But my gratitude also goes to the former president of the Austrian Republic, Heinz Fischer, who remains our president because he is now the president of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of Human Sciences. He's been a source of immense support and valuable advice throughout. So thank you very, very much. The Institute has been equally fortunate in the support it has received from several other governments, and I would just like to mention three representatives of all three are present here, fortunately, on this occasion the Polish Ministry of Science, the Czech Republic, whose foreign ministry has supported us recently with a generous grant to support our Patochka archives, as well as the Swiss government, which supports us in bringing students from Geneva to the Institute. The IWM has been equally lucky to have benefited from the generosity of several private donors and foundations. German and American foundations were very, very important when the institute was founded. The Erste Stiftung in Vienna and the Open Society Foundations continue to support us into the present. But the Institute has also been privileged to be able to draw upon the wise counsel of several distinguished individuals who have accompanied it through the past decades. Ira Katz Nelson, who unfortunately has had an accident and is unable to be with us today. Charles Taylor, who sends his regards as well. But happily, two members are here, or three actually are here today, whom I would like to mention, who have been with the Institute right since its founding. Klaus Nellen, who founded the Institute along with Krzysztof Misalski, Alexander Smoller, and also Klaus Offe. Many thanks for sharing this occasion with us. On the occasion of its 25th anniversary, my predecessor, Krzysztof Misalski, had expressed one wish and that was the IWM should not grow in size, but that its scholarship should bear fruit. I hope the latter is true. I'm afraid the former is not. The number of visiting fellows have increased from 60 to over 100 per year over the past three years, and the number of public events has doubled to more than 200 per year. 
I just want to mention two new events which some of you who are in the city may like to participate in. With our new partner, the Vienna Museum, we have been doing the Vienna Humanities Festival, turning the Kaltzplatz into an open political salon. Almost 4,000 visitors this year in 40 events over the weekend. And rather esoteric subjects, we opened with Reading Capital in the age of Trump. We closed it with a discussion of has liberal democracy and the democratic revolution ended? In between, we discussed the sexual revolution, the digital revolution, but also revolutionizing medicine through stem cell research. We made the mistake of naming a public event, which we started in Heuringer. We called it Science Speed Dating. <laughs> this turned out to be a serious mistake because many of those who attended did not quite take the science part of it seriously. And we even had a mother who approached me asking if it was possible to find a bride for her son. This year is going to therefore be called Science Speed Talks. It's difficult to predict how and in what direction the IWM will develop over the next years. For as you know, the future is not what it used to be. In an era of alternative facts, even the past is increasingly uncertain now. Academics may certainly not be the best at providing answers, but I hope that our new projects are asking at least the right questions amidst a host of changing problems and perspectives. Let me mention two, which will define some of our work in the future. There will be a reincarnation of our summer schools as of next year in cooperation with the European Forum Alpbach. They will concentrate on the topic of democracy and the demographic imagination focusing on changes not only in fertility rates, on migration, on emigration, the fear of small numbers and the politics around these numbers, not only in our region, but worldwide. Secondly, solidarity, which has been the theme of 10 years of transatlantic reflection at the Institute, because the Institute was also an important place for transatlantic dialogue, will continue to be a preoccupation but under a different rubric. Our new series of conferences will address what we called changing justifications of wealth. We would like to turn the optic away from looking at poverty to understanding questions of how wealth is being justified in different countries and contexts, how these justifications have changed over time, because we feel if we want redistribution to be back on the political agenda, we certainly will need to think about wealth as much as we think about poverty. With that, let me come to the last bit of my talk today, and that is, I would like to echo Christoph Michalski that the task of the Institute remains, and I quote him, to reflect on the divisions, to overcome exclusions, to pose the question as to the good life and proper organization of society. And it is to one such vital question to which this evening's lecture by Professor Michael Ignatiev is devoted. Drawing his inspiration from Jan Patochka, the Czech philosopher, whose archives we house, Professor Ignatiev addresses the question, what would it mean if we defined IWM's purpose as the care of the soul? It's a pleasure to introduce Michael Ignatiev, President and Rector of the Central European University and a friend of the IWM, who has graciously agreed to give tonight's talk at extremely short notice. He's a renowned scholar and a gifted writer. He was the leader of the Liberal Party of Canada before taking up the centennial chair at the Carnegie Council of, for Ethics in International Affairs in New York. Between 20, 2014 and 2016, he was the Edward R. Murrow Professor of the Practice of the Press, Politics and Public Policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. After his brilliant biography of Isaiah Berlin, he has written extensively and one topic on which he has written extensively is that of human rights. Let me just mention his latest book, 
the ordinary virtues, moral order in a divided world. It was published just a couple of months ago and is an exploration of whether there is a globalization of our values following upon economic globalization. And it asks a surprising question. What does globalization and resistance to it do to our conscience and our moral understanding? Surprisingly, again, he argues, locality matters, for ordinary virtues are key to solidarity and reconciliation in a divided world. Thank you very much for being with us, Michael, and the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'd want me to uh, thank these wonderful young musicians for doing what the Scotch call piping you in. <laughs> I feel piped in, and I thank you for um, a wonderful introduction, Mr. President, uh, distinguished guests. Um, we're here to celebrate the 35th anniversary of an institution that was created to serve as a bridge of free thought between an East, then behind the Iron Curtain, and a West that was free, but uncertain of its European destiny. 35 years later, it's more important than ever to maintain bridges between an East, where democracy still seems insecure, and a West tempted to cut its losses about a transition that never seems to arrive at its destination. IWM is a bridge, and a vital one, and it's dedicated to the proposition that there is one Europe, a Europe of the heart and mind, a Europe based in the idea I think best expressed when the Czech philosopher Jan Patočka spoke of philosophy and knowledge being devoted to the care of the soul. As you know, Patochka never lived to see the birth of IWM, but many of his students did. And the preservation of the Patochka archive, as Shalini has said, has been one of the IWM's longest projects. Plato and Europe, the lectures Patochka gave in the Czech underground on Aristotle and Plato, are among the greatest works of Eastern European thought in the time of resistance to communist oppression. Patochka himself, as you know, died shortly after police interrogation. And so on this anniversary, we owe Patochka and his generation the form of gratitude that looks like close examination of his heritage. And I want to spend just a minute with you, and I promise it's a minute, it's not an hour, arguing taking the phrase that Patochka used, the care of the soul, and arguing that the ultimate raison d'etre of institutions like the IWM and institutions like Central European University in Budapest and places of research and science around the world, their raison d'etre is the care of the soul. And the reason I want to say this is that Patochka's phrase lifts us up above utilitarian justifications of knowledge and science to the role that universities and institutions like IWM can play in a world that tries to banish the word soul from its vocabulary and keeps failing to do so. What would it mean, I want to ask, if we defined IWM's purpose as the care of the soul? What would happen if we actually took those words seriously? One of the things that's interesting when you start thinking about this is that the soul has never been the linguistic preserve of the religious. One of the most assiduous uses of the word soul is in the communist lexicon. Communists used to speak of the party artist and intellectual as engineers of human souls, using propaganda to refashion people in the image of the party. And this, it seems to me, is a very serious use of the word. I think they've got it right. Because what they're implying was that you could use political technologies to reach the deepest and most intimate sources of moral feeling and emotion inside human beings. So that's what the soul is. The communists were right. 
The soul is the deepest place inside us, the place where mind and body meet, where moral impulses are anchored, the place we struggle to keep whole against the pressures of our own instincts and the impulses of hatred, cupidity, and fear that invade us from outside, usually from the political world. The soul is the one place where emotion and reason, thought and desire have to find some kind of perilous unity. As you know, those who are religious, and some of you may be in the room, would say that the soul is immortal. But those who are not religious would also say that whatever happens after we die, the soul is our moral self, the site of the struggle to be less who we actually are and little more of what we could be. And so to care for our soul is simply to believe that our soul exists and that we cannot be whole without some attempt to live lives we can justify to ourselves and those nearest to us. And the idea of soul carries with it an important idea about moral risk, that there are things that we could do or there are things that we could be forced to suffer that would kill our souls. We know about this when people who have been tortured tell us that it kills their soul we may not know what they mean, or we may not know what it feels like to have your soul die, but we do know what they mean. And when St. Mark in the Gospel says, what does it profit a man to win the world but lose his soul, we know what he's talking about. We know that it's possible to achieve great wealth, great uh, power, <coughs> in a way that leaves you entirely dead inside. So care for the soul means avoiding those dangers as best we can. And the only way we can avoid those dangers is to understand how vulnerable we are, how deeply vulnerable we are, how fragile the soul is, how easily lost it is. So care for the soul means avoiding those kind of harms, but it also means seeking those experiences that refresh and renew our deepest inner resources. And there are things that we call good for the soul, remember? Walking in the woods, a fantastic concert, a long exhilarating climb, dancing, laughter with our loved ones. It's not merely that we enjoy these things. It's not merely that they give us pleasure or profit. When we say they're good for our soul, we say they've renewed and reaffirmed something in our inner core. And so when we say to care for the soul, to care is something we do all the time. It means we watch over someone, we take responsibility for them, we attend to them, we soothe and comfort them when they're hurt. And we do this willingly for our children, for our parents, when they're sick, our loved ones. So why shouldn't we pay similar attention to our own souls? And care is not an individualistic or quietistic duty, a quietist duty. Care for the soul is not a, a care to the exclusion of others. One of the paradoxes here is that once you care for your own soul, you tend to want to care for the soul of others too. So our souls need care because we're vulnerable, because we can be hurt, badly hurt, irrevocably damaged. We can lose ourselves, we can lose our natures, and the surest sign that that has happened is when we start believing there is no such thing as the soul anyway. So you, I've tried your patience, I know I have, I was taking a risk here. Uh, and you may be beginning to ask, besides looking at your watches, what can this possibly have to do with IWM? What can it possibly have to do with universities? What can it have to do with science, with knowledge, with research and teaching? Hasn't science itself questioned the very existence of the soul? Hasn't medicine pared back the envelope of the skin, poured deep inside the, the body and failed to find anything like a soul? Isn't Western knowledge the kind respected in the Institute for Human Sciences, isn't the Western knowledge that we celebrate today, especially its social science, a particularly deadly foe of those doctrines that believe there is such a thing as the soul? So if that's the case, how can we care for the soul in institutions that are devoted to the critical and skeptical pursuit of science and knowledge? Let's just remember that Jan Potochka thought differently. He had a different idea. He taught courses about Plato and Aristotle that were is austerely difficult. 
in small apartments in Prague in the 1960s for men and women like the man who became the great president Václav Havel. These were men and women hungering for an awakening beyond the soul-destroying experience of tyranny. And so care of the soul was not a kind of elaborate abstraction for Padochka. It's what he did in those apartments. It was the essence of his teaching. It affirmed that free thought and knowledge were the very condition of a soul's good health. Now, in those days of communist tyranny, the soul was truly on the line, as any of the veterans of that epoch will tell you. But can we still speak that language today? Let's just look at the pressures we're under. Let's just look at the pressures that our students and faculties face in 2017. They go way beyond attacks on academic freedom and institutional autonomy. At every point, the authority of the sciences we teach is contested. The civil discourse that we need in order to insert our arguments and facts into public debate is challenged. And this is the key point. Our innermost emotions, our innermost emotions as teachers and students are being restructured by modern engineers of modern souls. Those political technologists whose specialty is fake news, disinformation, and the cultivation of hatred. It's tough to do your job in that kind of environment because the legitimacy, the very legitimacy of what we do is under constant attack and the reflective civility that is the condition of the care of the soul is constantly being hammered at. Now don't get me wrong, no free institution should ever escape the burden of justifying itself to a society at large. But what we are facing goes well beyond the standard questions that democracies rightly ask of the institutions they support. What is new here is the aggressive delegitimation of knowledge by populist partisans and the cultivated, concerted cultivation of hatred towards the vulnerable by the new engineers of human souls. Our emotions, and I mean us in this room, I don't mean someone else, I mean us. Our emotions are under a continuous reshaping by the technological, the political technologies of the 21st century. And just let me give you one vivid example of that. Two years ago, in September 2015, the president made reference to this in his opening remarks. Two years ago in September 2015, generosity, compassion, and mercy, three very common virtues, were on abundant display in Europe, in the railway stations and roads of Europe, as citizens rushed to help frightened strangers with blankets, waters, and sometimes even a bed for the night. And then the political technologists went to work. And now these emotions, generosity, compassion, and mercy, have been confiscated. To be generous to a stranger is to be a fool. To be compassionate is to be naive. And to display solidarity towards refugees and migrants is disgraced in some countries as a betrayal of the nation itself. And we need to understand that this is something more menacing than the standard political partisanship that is the currency of political democracy. A whole new climate, a whole new political environment has been normalized. Our emotions are being re-inscribed, rewritten, reworked, and the result is a coarsening and a deadening that lays the road clear for cruelty and even tyranny. What can a university do about this? We're one institution among many, and we simply cannot counter the technologies of the, 20, the political technologies of the 21st century with a technology of our own, or still less with an ideology of our own. That would contradict the freedom on which our enterprise is built, and we're not a political organization. But we do need to recover the sense that the critical and civil pursuit of knowledge is the care of the soul. Our work, never more important than now, is not simply to insist that our students graduate with the understanding that there is such a thing as knowledge, that it's hard to come by, there are techniques by which you can master it, and that once found, even if it's discomforting, it is the only reliable guide to responsible action in the world. We need to do that, but we need to do more. 
We need to warn our students to the danger to their soul of believing that compassion, mercy, and generosity are the province of dupes and traitors. We need to warn them of the danger to their soul of believing that science is an elite conspiracy against the sound instincts of the majority. And we need to tell them once again that democracy needs a lot of things, but chief among them is a citizenry with the independence of mind and the resilience of heart to care for their own souls and the souls of those around them. And if we understood the stakes in this way, I think we would be truly worthy, we would be truly worthy of the heritage of Jan Patochka and the great men and women who created this institution. Thank you. Thank you.